Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Speak Up. Today's special edition has to do with a, a, a particular case that is a little different from the normal cases that we're used to airing. This one involves the Attorney General and the Banking Commission here in New Hampshire. When both agencies start tackling one person, their world can be completely turned upside down. This show is just about that, especially when that person was innocent. This is the story of petitioner number 18, who took his case to the Supreme Court and won, but in the process, he had to pay at least $180,000. Is that justice? Now, I'd like to introduce my next guest, Mr. Jeff Frost. Jeff, come, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, Jeff. Uh, listen, you're, you're petitioner number 18 yep. with the Redress of Grievance Committee. Uh, recently, the Attorney General came out and basically kind of talked down the committee saying it's just a, a platform for angry dads and uh, we're kind of here to tell <laughs> your story because you're not an angry dad. No. Your no. petition has nothing to do with family courts. No, nothing. Nothing at all. It has to do with basically government abuse right, to the, at the highest degree, I think. So. You're from that, uh, Manchester. Correct. Manchester, yep. you're a Marine? Uh, former Marine. Pilot. Uh, yep, former uh, A4 pilot. Went to uh, American Airlines, was a captain with them almost 20 years at American and then retired and uh, always had uh, we had a family real estate business up north and I kind of sold all that and shifted it down to Manchester and got the headaches down there now yeah with nice. the real estate which is where this all was generated from well tell us about the story take us from the beginning what how did all this start with the you uh, a very fraudulent person sent a very derogative and fraudulent complaint to New Hampshire uh, AG's office as a consumer complaint. <clears throat> he had bought a property from myself and another buddy. It was really the other guy's second home. It was a second home on Newfound Lake. He rented it. He drafted up uh, a mortgage, uh, a note, uh, a lease option, you know, to purchase, and then uh, purchased the property with another person. And then immediately afterwards, about three or four months, uh, started missing payments, tax payments, stuff like that. Unbeknownst to us, this guy had a former history of a lot of type of fraud, what I call fraud. And uh, so uh, we foreclosed on him, and when we foreclosed on him, um, he sent in a complaint the day after he got foreclosed on to the banking department. Uh, well, to the AG's office. And I'll they, fix you, basically. Yeah, I'll fix you, yeah. It was, uh, well, he had actually emailed two or three times saying, if you don't pay me money, uh, I'm going to file criminal complaints against you. So... And everybody that looked at it thought that was, you know, extortion via email, you know, trying to force you to pay, you know. And um, so uh, he files this complaint. It had a lot of very erroneous, false, you know, fraudulent uh, statements, paperwork, a number of things. <clears throat> and what was really amazing was when he filed the complaint, it was right there that he had lied in federal bankruptcy court because he... What he lied about was he said, I never had in the last eight years any bankruptcies, where in fact he had three and five in the last ten. And so the judge wasn't happy about that. He didn't show up, he threw, threw, threw it out. And so that's where, you know, this all started with a very fraudulent person filing a very fraudulent complaint at a wrong time. And it got thrown out of court. Uh, the, yeah, we got to foreclose. I mean, his bankruptcy filing got, again, you know, and so... <clears throat> The uh, AG's office sent it to the banking department. They kind of worked together. It was a very new person working the job at the AG's office. 
who didn't have any experience really in real estate and business law. Um, definitely not banking. And um, then they just decided, well, whatever he said is true. Whatever I said is false. You're guilty, Mr. Frost. You're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. And that was their attitude from day one. It was, um, a lot of people call it a lynch mob, not a John Lynch mob. Right. <laughs> but, uh, right. you know, or a, um, a, a Salem witch hunt, you know. Or as some people said the way they acted it when they went into my house is like the Gestapo. But I, so that's a little over the top. The complaint was filed. The, the banking commissions are involved at, at this yep. point. And yep. Peter Hildreth was at the top at the time. Uh, um, and they basically said, you're guilty. They circumvented much of their own laws to get an illegal search warrant. Um, search not only my house, uh, looking for paperwork that we told them was all public. We'd be more than happy to give it to them. Uh, but the lawyers, they also went to my law firm unannounced and said, we want to you know, get this paperwork. Um, and then they... Um, so they searched the law firm. They searched, they searched the, house. the house and the law firm, and, and all, it, illegally based on yep. based on based on a lie, basically a couple of lies. Okay. Could and they have known that this was a lie? Could they have figured it out if they just asked? You know, if they just would listen, but they wouldn't. They had it was amazing. It, the attitude was just amazing. So they went in headstrong, yep. based upon a hearsay, if, yeah. if anything, and, right. and without even you know, hey, come in for an interview. Let's let's you know. Let's talk. It seemed to me from day one and from the lawyers, which the lawyers were amazed, to get a search warrant in a law firm on something as silly as this is amazing. First of all. Second of all, their procedures are to get a subpoena. Because the subpoena says, and the law firm says, get a, a subpoena and we'll go in and a judge will decide whether you guys are crazy or not or not. You know, whether you're legally, you know, out of your minds because it seemed like they were just acting a little bit. It was, uh, again, uh, they were just real, they just decided there's something here. And our feedback at the time, at, reality at the time was FRM was going on, and both the AG's office and the banking department, uh, Peter Hildreth, were under huge scrutiny. For our, our viewers, what is FRM? Uh, Financial Resource Management, which was a company that took people's money to buy real estate and promised to pay them back. But instead, they just spent the money and a quasi and it, yeah, pyramid. kind of a scam. It was right. a big scam, and uh, it was like twenty million dollars. They're still trying to work it out and pay people back. Uh, the state took it over. The two gentlemen involved, Dodge and Farah, uh, went to jail, and so this was heavily in the papers. There was a lot of scrutiny on both the banking department and the AG's office, and you know, and plus it was right during the, the uh, real estate crash. You know, the, quote, mortgage crisis, it was the, the crime de jour. And so... Um, they were they, out to set an example. They, uh, they always uh, arrest the usual suspects. <laughs> you know, it was like, find anybody, arrest them. Now, you weren't licensed to sell real estate, were you? Or no. Right. No, no, no. This was just... As we did, this gentleman came to us and said, I want to lease your place. We were just trying to rent it. And he said, would you be interested in uh, selling it? And we said, yeah, we have it for sale because the other person that owned it was in Iraq at the time, and now he's in Afghanistan, so he wasn't using it. So we decided to sell it, and we gave him a fair price, and he wrote it all up, and uh, you know, I specifically asked him if he had any bankruptcies, and et cetera, et cetera. And we sold it on an um, option, a lease option. He exercised his option and said, here, I want, a, I want a, a private mortgage, which was very legal at the time. And that was one of the big problems with this case was um, they tried applying a new law retroactively. So there was really two constitutional violations. So the banking industry is involved with this. And when, and did, the the office. W when did the Attorney General's office get involved? They How? were actually the beginning. Oh. Uh, the, the lady that he hired, uh, uh, a prosecutor basically, was he hired, I understand, under uh, funds from uh, Obama um, stimulus money to do mortgage fraud. And like I said before, I think I, I, we talked earlier before the show started, she really didn't have any experience in banking or real estate or business law, maybe a little bit. She was a prosecutor in the Hillsborough County Prosecutor Department. And um, so she took and kind of handed it both to her office, and she went off on her tangent on the criminal side, and the banking department went on their tangent on the administrative side, the civil side. And, uh, 
I just pumped up a bunch of charges, came into the house, came into the law firm, arrested me a few, about a week and a half later, and then two weeks after that, without any hearings, without ever seeing a judge, without giving me a chance to go up to the banking department to explain my side, they arrest me and charge me with all these charges. We're all retroactive and just uh, it couldn't exist. One of them didn't even exist. Peter Hilders just made it up. How, how do you fight something that, that <laughs> a law that's retroactive? What yeah. were you thinking at this point? What, what, was, was, what um, was going through your mind when all these agencies, how many agencies were involved with this? It was, well, the banking and the AG's office. Okay. So, I mean, two pretty big, powerful agencies. Right. Both so. coming down on you at the oh, same time. time. Yep. Any other agencies involved? No. Nope. Okay. Just, nope. That's enough, obviously. Yeah. So you're hammered with this. Your head's spinning around. You, you, oh, it was amazing. You, you don't know. I mean, this is just a, a small transaction. Right. Well, not a small transaction. Just it's a normal. Right. There are thousands of these done every, day, right. every year. It, this was equivalent to saying somebody that was going 70 miles an hour in the old 70 mile an hour speed limit on the highways, now that we have this new 55 mile an hour speed limit, we're going to arrest you because we knew you were doing 70 miles an hour. And yet everybody in the state of New Hampshire had that legal right. <laughs> so they basically were saying, well, you know, we're going to apply this law retroactively. And, it, and all the lawyers are scratching their heads. Everybody is saying to them, you can't do this. Where were the checks and balances? There Where? was none. There was none. none. The checks and balance were actually in the banking law. Banking law said their procedure was get a subpoena, you know, particularly if you're unlicensed. And, and the, they went after the LLCs. I became a mortgage uh, loan originator months after, a year after I really met this guy. And all this happened, and the, and the uh, contract that he provided. So, but they didn't even know that. And their research was so poor that they didn't even know that. And I knew that there was nothing involved with that. I'd never had any, you know, problems, and I really did it part time. Um, and I, so I kept telling them, "What are you? Where are you coming from? Where, where was this coming from?" And the lawyers kept asking, "What's going on?" You know, the law firm was like, "You want to search us based on something that has." Not a criminal crime, really. Nobody's getting hurt. He did one of these things, uh, and I don't, we we weren't even told how or why they how they got this um, uh, search warrant. Matter of fact, they were negotiating and saying, "Well, you know, maybe we'll get a subpoena." Literally, I, what the law firm said was, and I was out of the country when they did this, and they broke into my house. Um, the law firm was saying that they were literally negotiating, saying. Oh, yeah, we'll get a subpoena, we'll get a subpoena, as they're walking in with a search warrant. Basically lying to them. I mean, it was... So what happens when these agencies don't obey the very laws that, they, that are instituted? What, <laughs> what... So far, nothing. And, and the lawyers are scratching their heads. They're, this is kind of way out of the norm. This is an unprecedented oh, yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, but it, with transactions that happen like this by every the day. thousands oh, yeah. a year. Yeah, so every, every New Hampshire citizen has a right to, at the time to do four. Right. what they call owner financing. It's basically, and, and, and it's a very important tool for real estate, particularly for people, investors. I have, we have real estate investment. I had never done one before until the year before. I'd never even, even thought about them. And realtors normally ask you if you own the property outright, which we did on this property, would you consider taking back, and it's called an installment sale. And the IRS calls them a, a specifically an installment sale. And why this is so important is that if you have a bunch of real estate and you want to retire on it, then you want to take these back, control your assets that you've built up and put all your sweat equity in, and right. get paid over time. And that's a big thing. And also it helps the person. It's been a free contract. It's the way people have been buying real estate for a thousand years. So, you know, it, it, it was such a, it was, it was, as one lawyer said, he goes, I'm basically shocked that they're trying to do this. They were trying to set you up as though you're doing business as. As a banker. As they a, tried to say, because of this one transaction that was totally illegal at the time, you were an unlicensed mortgage banker. That's how they squeezed it in after they went through my house but the and fact realized that, were, that there was nothing there. The fact that you were unlicensed doesn't... It doesn't matter because it was, it was a totally legal transaction. If you were licensed, that would have given the banking commission more of a, 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 a right to come into your house? Uh... As a mortgage banker? Yeah. Uh, no, where they have to go legally, the way their law is set up, if you're a mortgage banker or broker under the new law, okay, or even the old law, they have a right to come in unannounced, 
right, right into your business address. The LLCs was basically, I had them registered in my little office in my home. I mean, you know, because that's where I got the mail and the, you know, and, and we rented the place. So it was, uh, you know, it was. So you're at a point now, your head's spinning, you're, yeah. you're overwhelmed with these two agencies coming at you, and then all of a sudden they offer you a deal. Do, do they offer a plea bargain with you at some point? No. Nope. Um, what they, uh, well, they, two weeks after I got arrested, the bank department says, oh, by the way, you know, here's $525,000 in fine. We're going to bring you into our court, into our civil hearing, and say, <clears throat> you know, you, are, um, you need to prove that what we've already arrested you for is wrong. Prove yourself like, innocent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How does that work? Yeah. I said, well, you America. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought, and, and that actually circumvented their procedures too. What's normally what happens if they think somebody is outside of their licensing and doing something, you know, somebody is a fraud, a real fraud. And I understand that. And the laws are, are, are good laws, I think. But they have to be applied. You have to understand them and use them correctly and not oppressively. Mm -hmm. um, then they come in and they say, okay, shut, shut yourself down. This is a civil crime. It's not killing anybody. It's not a drug or murder crime. Okay, we're going to shut you down. The AG gives you a warning. They give you a warning. You have a chance to have a hearing. And then the hearing goes to this administrative hearing, and they have a judge. Well, they're all in the same office. So the guy next to them is saying, well, this guy, I think, is guilty, and you're going to judge whether he is guilty or not. And normally, they, I've been told they run fairly fairly to a point. But there's always normally a fine involved or some penalty. But... So anyways, I didn't get that hearing. They just said, and they didn't say cease and desist. They didn't do any of that. They just said, we want to see this paperwork. And then when they couldn't get it, and they broke into my house and went in it, and then they, they didn't find what they want. I don't really think they were kind of surprised because they were just, you know, the blinders were on. They said, well, we'll arrest them for this stuff, and we'll throw all this stuff at them, the unlicensed mortgage banker. And, um, you know, it, it made no sense. So... Um, so here they're handing you a $500,000 fine. 525000 for that. And then if they were going to indict the LLCs, they were each going to be $100,000. It started out with that. And then $2,000 per each criminal misdemeanor, which was four at first, and uh, four years in jail, you know, if they won completely. So that was how it started out. So you <laughs> handed these circumstances. What do you say? What do you do? What did oh, you do? Oh, man, I... I, I, I <laughs> It was uh, pretty tough on me and my wife. I had to resign. I had a mud shot taken. I took a mud shot. I had to resign. I was the board chairman of the Manchester Red Cross. Um, I was doing my civic duty. I really enjoyed that job. Um, and of course, I can't be going out there. You know, I had to immediately resign. I knew everything they, they said about me and what was happening was erroneous. I had kept that email. Um, most of the board understood. A lot of them were bankers, you know, vice president of banks and stuff like that. And, they were like, I can't understand this. This doesn't make any sense. Nobody could figure this out. Um, and, you know, it was real tough on my wife and I. I'm sure you're communicating with the Attorney General at this point. Yep. So um, immediately after we got the evidence that there was something wrong with their search warrant, their search warrant basically was based on a lie. As Judge Kinghorn said, it was a misrepresentation. It's a nice way that they, they call it. <clears throat> a search warrant. So both that they broke into my house and they surrounded it with five police cars, I heard, for five hours. Went through every room in the house, including our bedrooms and attics, and they took computers and my cell phone. And I had just had all my accounting done through my bookkeeper, ready to do my taxes. And they pulled out all of that stuff in my office, which was totally, it showed them that it was all rents. It was all rental properties, you know. And... Uh, took copies of checks and went through every file. It was pretty oppressive. You know, I was a Marine for a long time. Uh, and I, you know, when I talk to this to other people that know, they say it's very much like being in a, you good, know, good Iraq stuff. or uh, Russia or China, uh, you know, in countries where you have no rights, you know, or Iran right now. So it was, um, as I said, once the people, I said, you know, I never thought I'd have to defend my constitution here in the United States against my own attorney general and the banking department, the state of New Hampshire, an agency in the state of New Hampshire. So immediately after, immediately after the search warrant, we got the affidavit and we saw what the judge had written, uh, a very, very good criminal lawyer, Kathy Green. Um, 
writes a letter both to this prosecutor who was gung-ho and says, you need to give this immediately to the attorney general because you're in, we see a serious illegal search. And we didn't hear anything. And then for about a week and a half, two weeks, we didn't hear anything. And they came back and they said a completely different reason as to why they went in. And they made this, I think, excuse up. And it was based, again, retroactively on a new law. So they, and it was just, to me, it just said, well, we don't care. We're going to prosecute you. So then there was more and more warning. It went all the way up to the attorney general. The attorney general, you know, had multiple letters, multiple phone calls, trying to explain to them, look, it, if you continue on this path, you're going to end up losing, and, and you have a serious problem here with the search warrant. And he just turned his back on it. And he was the guy that I was hoping finally, and as one letter said, uh, you know, in her 30 years or so in crime, he's hoping that, you know, you would at least realize that this, this was not something that should be prosecuted, you know. And, and when, particularly when everybody in, the, in New Hampshire has been doing it, and lawyers advised me, you know, this co these contract was done by lawyers. Real estate, very good real estate lawyers. And they were all shocked that this was going on. So now he's got a deaf ear, the yep. Attorney General's Oh, yeah. Office. Oh, and, yeah. And your pressure fork, gets put up. You're forking up a lot of money for, for attorney's fees oh. at this point. Yeah. And where does it go now? I, it goes to uh, the new business court, uh, Judge McNamara, which it should have done from the very beginning with a subpoena, just gone into a judge and say, do you have jurisdiction to do this? Are you legally correct in doing this? Mm -hmm. And they circumvented that by getting a search warrant. So they go to Judge McNamara. Judge McNamara looks at this, and uh, he had quite a few questions to ask him. And it was pretty interesting, as Oriel or talking them quite a bit. And he came back and said, no, you know, I'm putting an injunction, injunction on this. You don't have jurisdiction. You shouldn't have done this. Matter of fact, you know. Who shouldn't have done this? Them. The yeah, they said he's, he said this is totally legal. The Attorney General's office. Right. right. And the Attorney General's office and the banking department had no jurisdiction. Basically, his was the banking department. The attorney general office represented the banking department on the banking part, and that's what we went to his side on. And then we went into district court for the criminal side. <laughs> and first thing we did was go to front of the judge for the uh, illegal search. And the illegal search, he came back and said, you know, uh, it was he's going to suppress it. It's the way they say it. And it was multiple misrepresentations that. that you know, he, had the judge known that these were the facts, he never would have issued a search warrant. So but the, he the was safety giving, net was there, but they weren't applied. No, actually, they were certain. <laughs> actually, they, they, what they said was, you know, I mean, there was no way that they could say what they said to this judge and find it. They said they looked at the mortgage at the registry of deeds, and it indicated he was a mortgage banker, or that the LLC was a mortgage banker. Does and the, there's nothing in there. Does there's, the judge turn around and say, listen, you just violated this guy. You're going to get a fine. No. no they, um, what basically it boiled down to is um, the state is always immune, it's, at least they, for the most part. It's very hard, and, and we all know that. Uh, it, it's wrong. It's wrong that it's a one-way street, right. um, particularly when it reaches this degree, because it was obvious that uh, you know, after they realized they had a stinky case, um, they did try to put some more pressure on. They were going to indict the LLCs, and that, that became a whole different ballgame. So, so far, you're exonerated. Uh, yeah. Everything is uh, uh, legal searches, both right. criminally and civilly, whatever. Right. And now they're still tightening up the screws? Um, well, they, they uh, appealed. You know, they appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court. Tightening up the screws. So, yeah, tightening up the screws. And um, prior to going to Judge McNamara's court, um, and that's a, he's a very... You know, I'm told he's a very brilliant judge, uh, has a lot of respect. It was a special business court made for these type of business actions where you have some business background, you know, real estate, insurance, and all that. Um, they really tightened up the screws and tried to indict the LLCs. And uh, that would have affected the other person who owned the house who was a member, you know, this house. The reason we had the home in an LLC was to protect us for lawsuits for renting it because he wanted to rent it. Right. And he was a lawyer, former lawyer, and he was actually basically acting as a, as a lawyer for the State Department in Iraq at the time. And uh, he would have lost his security clearance, and that would have been pretty serious. So, so, you know, I mean, that's when I said, 
you know, I, that's when I really got gut wrenched. That's when I, uh, that's when I said, they don't care. They want a win at any cost, and that that that's when it really, to me, got abusive. And uh, every one of the ways I said, you know, I I will fall on my sword not to have him lose his job, because I knew how important it was for many reasons. Um, and every one of my lawyers was saying, just don't. They said, I got to advise you, don't do it. I said, well, I got to call him. And, and he backed me up and said, you know, he kind of laughingly said, well, I'll take the bottom bunk, you take the top bunk. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to fight this to the end. <laughs> yeah. So he was a good, he, he got protected by a lot of Marines. So he's, he's a very good friend. And uh, he, he was apoplectic because, you know, being a guy that had been, you know, working with setting up the judicial system in Iraq, trying to teach them how to understand a law and how to use it, you know, non-abusively and non-oppressively because it can be, you know, you can act like a totalitarian, you can act like Saddam and just do what you want. He says, I, I can't believe this. He's falling victim to the very same thing that he's trying to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people that I know that have said that. So you appeal to the Supreme Court. Yep. Costs you another. You weren't, weren't going to take it. Yeah. I'm going for it. Right. We asked for attorney fees after we won everything. You, okay. So the, they did for, drop the. They for our dropped viewers, the, Yep. You, you, you and uh, McNamara said, "Look, it had it been anybody but the state of New Hampshire, I'd award you attorney fees." But they have this quote, legal thing, you know, immunity. He said, "But I can go, you, I can go to the legislator, or I can go to the two departments and and get a, you know, have them work out a deal to pay the attorney fees." Because basically, what I did, it was the first case of its kind in the nation, because huh? nobody would ever ever even think to do something like this. Was, how much did you, how much did it cost you to defend yourself in, in this, uh, it was, um, this monkey court? <laughs> and no, no yeah. offense to Judge McMahon, he no, no. was doing a no, very good job. No, it was these guys just, you know, they, they can use the law for, for you know, I mean, they can wear you down. It's a war of attrition. And, uh, you know, I, and I got to that point, when they went to the point trying to destroy this other person, I thought, uh, knowing that that was going to put pressure on, that's when I said, I don't care. I'll go bankrupt. My wife was the same way. She was so, she goes, I don't care. You know, it's, we're spending the kids' college money that we had, you know, had gotten a line of credit on, on a house, and I was using that, and it was, it was really tough. But then I just said, okay, you, 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 the Marine's not, I'm charging. I'm not backing right. off. And, um, and you won. Yeah, we won. Yeah, of course we won. I mean, it, it just never seemed, you know, of course, you never know how, you know, people are going to act. And um, the, in the Supreme Court, they said there was, it was an abusive behavior, but they didn't look, or McNamara didn't look at what happened prior to us going to his court. Just and that's the when the, that he had right, to deal with. Right, and, and their attitude, and, and uh, it was, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You know? And so you end up before the redress of grievances because you spent 180... No, 182 was spent. Uh, a couple, I didn't, two of the lawyers that had to come in uh, and because they had written up these mortgages under their legal counsel because they would have been malpractice, which also means there's some judges that could have been in malpractice because there was judges and there was lawyers. There's all sorts of people that had advised clients in these installment sales, these owner financing right. sales, you know, which are very good for real estate and for, for certain people who want to go for the banks. And um, so, you know, they came in to protect themselves from malpractice because if I lost, I could turn around and say, why would you tell me to do something that was illegal? Right. And they're like, this is crazy. And they, so they spent some time, and I submitted that, you know, what their costs were, which I feel I should, you know, why, you know, I, I felt it was like about fourteen or 15000 So it added up to one hundred eighty two, about $185,000. So which is not just, easy you, when you're trying to put two kids through right. college. I mean, I, I stroked some checks that, Gave me a heart attack. You stressful. The American very dream. stressful. You, yeah. you, you served your country, you're, and then all of a sudden, this happens to you. It, you your your world is upside down now. You, now you before the redress of grievance to at least see if if the legislature uh, was, can can make some uh, do exactly what McNamara said. Right. The judge said you can do it by statute. Which is, you know, and take which, it out of their budget. <laughs> right? Yeah, take it out of the budget. Well, he said, you know, they can, you can write a, do it by statute, and, and it's been done, obviously, and yep. it's illegally, it's totally legal. The re, the redress of grievance is probably been around. I mean, it's constitutionally Article endowed one, in our constitution from the very beginning. It's the whole reason why we're a different country in a different state. 
than any other country or state in the world because we, the people, have a right to go to the people's house and say, look it, my government is out of control against me. And I know, you know, in, in, in the old days, you, what do you do? You either get hurt or killed or, or, or your money's taken away. And the only thing, the only redress you got is to either fight it with weapons or leave or, you know, go away or, or get abused. And there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And that's why we had this, because that's, it's so old and it's the only way we can get people to have any type of chance to clean up government. Well, Speaker O'Brien's getting some heat for it, but, uh, one, you know, if, if you're going to get heat for anything, at least you're giving the people a, a right to speak up. Sure. And, and, and it's such a, a filter. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it, you, it's so hard to get there. And so I think anybody that gets into the redress of grievance has got a pretty good case. You know, at least should be looked at some from of the what people, I've seen. Some of the people have been arguing, well, that's such an old article. It's an old law. It should be uh, amended and, and, and done away with. And, and some of the people were actually in the media saying that. And I'm thinking, you know, so should we get a, rid of the First right. Amendment or your, your right, of, right to free speech or the free right. press? Right. It's, it's a constitutional right. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's so beautiful that it's there. And right. I, I don't understand why it's getting so much flack. I don't either. It makes no sense because we don't have, uh, and there's been a real call for this, we don't have a uh, ombudsman's, right. we don't have any type of way to say in the process, and, and this is what I was trying to get, you know, to the redress agreements. They were basically using their, their right to law to throw me in the court as the pressure point, abusively. I think it was abusive from the very beginning that they used their power to throw me in the court and say, you're guilty, you're guilty, guilty, and we're going to throw any type of thing we can at you. That process should be at least, they should have somebody that say, they can say, whoa, wait a minute, stop, because this redress of grievance is, is somebody can go there and say, look at you can take a look at this, take a look at this. Right. And um, it adds a little checks and balances. Because if you don't, and I, 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 you know, I was reading Hamilton's Federalist Papers, and he talked about state totalitarianism by certain people. Now, I gave you the case of Duke Lacrosse. Right. Now, Duke Lacrosse, they had a very aggressive prosecutor like what happened to me, who, during the investigation, said, I don't want to listen to anything. You're guilty. <clears throat> now, these people, those poor guys got thrown into the ringer, just like I did. Much different case, but same kind of thing. They had a very shady accuser, you know, and then they had a very aggressive prosecutor. In that case, the attorney general, shut the case down, took his prosecutor off. The prosecutor actually got disbarred and spent one day in jail. And they ended up paying, uh, you know, the Duke University and the state ended up paying a lot of money. And they never even, you know, they never even really got the court. They never had to go all the way to win. So, you know, that's why I was really, you know, I was depending on the Attorney General to act, you know, responsibly, but uh, didn't What happen. happens when the Attorney General has to represent an agency? And a citizen. Oh well, it looks like he's going to follow the agency no matter what. <laughs> it's it's pretty. Uh... And you know, and and I I you know I I've talked to a lot of people. You know, the, all the agencies are there supposedly to help business progress without right. hammering them. You know, we have this three strikes in your outlaw. Well, and it seems like most of the agencies now it's like one strike and we're going to hammer you. We're going to fine you. You know, at least in my case, and I've heard it from many other people. Over fining, over oppressive, over violated. You know they're being violated, and uh, you know people that have gone in, they have a fifty thousand dollar fine from OSHA or DRA or DES or somebody, and then it gets knocked down to five hundred or a thousand dollars. But you know a lot of people say it just costs too much money to fight them. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people have done have told me that. Uh, so just they pay just pay the fine and continue. It's, it's yeah, cost of doing business. Yeah. It's almost it kind of reminds me of Al Capone. Pay me or I'll burn your house down. I, I visited Russia <laughs> one time, and it, it was uh, I think in the year 2000. We were doing a, a, some type of musical thing, and uh, we were just traveling through Moscow. Right. And uh, just a group of us, and all of a sudden we, we see all these, these machine guns, guys with machine guns, just, they just wave you over and pull over. Mm -hmm. And I asked the driver, I said, what's going on? It's the bribe. Yeah, it's the bribe. It's yeah. the bribe. I've yeah, seen he won't next. let us go on until we do the bribe. And so... Takes him, walks across the street, empties out his pockets. Yeah, oh, free to go. Nothing happened. Right. You know, I see it in Mexico. It yeah. used to happen. We were in San Diego, and I was told you I was the reserve side of Top Gun with the Navy, and we'd go across the border, and I always brought twenty or forty, fifty bucks. I mean, you'd just be driving, and you just 
change a lane, they pull you over. You change the lane too fast or whatever, you give them $20 and you leave you alone. It's yeah. not the style that we want to end up like. Right. Yeah. We really don't. Jeff, is there anything else you want to tell our, our viewers? Uh, anything that, uh, final thoughts? Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and yeah. telling your story. Well, I, 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 I think the grievance, when I read that that um, committee was in existence, again, that they kind of brought it back, I immediately jumped on it and said, this is because we have no other avenue as citizens and because it's the people's house. Right. I think it was, uh, yeah, immediately I said, boy, they're going to love this one. And I remember when I first came in and I said to the, somebody, you, you weren't on the panel, but I said to somebody in the panel, I said, uh, this is going to be the best redress of grievance you're going to have all year. And they started looking at it and they said, you know what, you're right. <laughs> because this was two constitutional violations that was right. just, you're guilty, we don't want to hear it anymore. Right. So. Well, thanks for telling your story. And uh, if, if there's anybody else out there that has a, a story similar to, to Mr. Frost's, please contact me at speakupnewhampshire uh, at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story. Uh, obviously, it has to be vetted, and, and uh, you have to have your doc documentation and, and uh, your ducks lined in a row. But uh, if you feel as though you've been abused, we want to hear it. Every day, Citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.